Hello, my name is Jane Friedman, and if you're familiar with my work, you probably know me as someone who focuses on the business concerns of publishing and writing. And I'm very comfortable giving nuts and bolts advice and information on how the digital age is transforming uh, the future careers of authors. This talk is a little bit different. It focuses more on what makes certain writers more competitive uh, and capable than others of thriving in the digital age. Uh, sometimes I call these people competitive creatives. So why do some people, some creative people, seem to call all the shots and have all the success while maybe you follow all the same steps and don't see the same results? So this talk is a little bit about that, as well as some of the myths uh, that are part of the writing landscape and that can stand in the way of your success. What I love about this cartoon is the way that it illustrates how creative people often feel very divided about what path to follow. They often have a very rational side, very adult responsibility side that feels they must go down a certain path, and then a more creative, emotional side that wants to pursue what it wants to pursue, and it's very hard to bring these two things together. In fact, you may feel this way about a lot of things in life, not just your creative endeavors, but I think it shows that the, the tension that we can feel between different parts of ourselves in terms of how to develop a career, what we want to write, and how we shape the creative life. If we looked at this in another way, the, the war that's happening uh, in ourselves and also out in society to some extent, there's this idea of the starving artist. Those two words, starving, artist, you could also use writer, they go together a little bit too well. <laughs> and in, our, in our imaginations, in our way of expressing things, the two words so naturally go together that we don't even think about why do we express it this way? How did it come to be this way? Has it always been this way? And in fact, it hasn't been. The starving artist idea is a myth, and I don't use the word myth in a pejorative sense. I'm really using it more in the sense that Alan Watts used to use it in his lectures. If you're not familiar with Alan Watts, he was a spiritual guru who came to prominence in the United States in the 60s and 70s, and he was kind of an East meets West personality. He was able to decipher Eastern philosophies for a Western audience, and he often talked about the myths that the, that the Western world operated on. And so if I want to take a look at the writing and publishing community, particularly the literary community, then... We have this myth that we operate on, neither good nor bad, it just is, of the starving artist and this idea that it's hard for art and business to come together, that they're warring factions, whether inside ourselves or out in the marketplace. Now, I want to jump to a little bit of history because I researched where this idea of the starving artist came from, and it's actually connected to a very particular phenomenon in book publishing history. Right here, you're seeing the number of books that were published annually in the UK from 1750 to 1900. And you can see there was this enormous jump uh, from 1825 to 1900, and that was mainly a result of growing literacy and the explosion of publications that came about to serve a more literate public. So as a result, you got a lot of reading coming out in the 1800s that today we would call light reading or entertainment, you know, romances and westerns and ghost stories. Uh, these are some covers of some of the books of that time. And there were people who were not excited about this. They felt like proper literature was getting crowded out by all of this light entertainment, and they also felt like their own books were suffering because people were going towards these lighter reads rather than the more serious literature. One of these people was a German by the name of Carl Philip Moritz, and he basically wrote a book that was a little bit of whining about how you know, no one was paying attention to his poetry. 
And he was making the argument that because his work wasn't gaining traction, because it wasn't selling, that that, in fact, made it great art. Now, I am simplifying the argument to an extent, but his the thrust of what he was saying was that you know you're producing something of value when the great masses don't accept it. And thus was born this idea of the starving artist, this idea kind of caught on. And, of course, one of the reasons it caught on was because of the great explosion in in materials that were being written and published which crowded out uh, the more serious literature. Now if we zoom to the present time, just take a, a great big leap, 100 or 200 years, you'll notice that actually we're seeing a lot of the same phenomenon and there are people complaining that author incomes are declining which is a very kind of topsy-turvy argument to make, considering that in the literary community, the hallmark of great literature is supposed to be, in some respects, not so great commercial success, yet we're complaining that the commercial success for authors is not appropriate. So there's a lot of double messaging going on, a lot of different types of myths going on. The old myth of the starving artist is coming up against um, a new myth that authors deserve to make a living wage based on what they produce. So whether you look at the UK or the United States, you'll find a lot of uh, toiling over new surveys and um, new studies that show it's harder to make a living as a writer, which I would dispute to some extent. I don't think the picture is as bad as these surveys portray, especially when you're looking at the very broad spectrum of both traditionally published and independently published authors. But I digress. The, the larger point I want to make is that we have these double standards of uh, art isn't concerned with business, um, great art doesn't necessarily make money, yet authors are supposed to make a living based on great literature. Here I'll invoke probably the most stereotypical person possible, Andy Warhol, on the topic of art and business. Uh, you may be familiar with one of his very famous quotes, which is, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. I'm t inclined to be on his side of things. I don't see business and art as opposed to each other. But this, I, this belief, I don't think, really goes along with how most artists or writers feel about the marketplace. Dana Joya, when he was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, gave multiple interviews where he talked about the intersection of business and art, because he's a very interesting figure if you're not familiar with him. He has both an MBA and an MFA, and he's uh, a significant and major poet at least in the United States. So he, in these interviews that he gave about this intersection of business and art, because he was such a fascinating figure and the perfect figure to be leading the NEA, he said, once you get into middle and upper management, the decisions that you make are largely qualitative and creative. So he was talking about how having an artistic background, having a creative background made him a much better business person the further up uh, in leadership roles that he got. And he also made the reverse argument that having uh, business can also inform art in good and productive ways. Jessica Abel is a really wonderful mentor and coach and guide for lots of artists out there. If you're not familiar with her, I recommend going to her site and reading some of her excellent posts, particularly one that talks about how every artist needs a business model, if, if that's how you want to make a living. And, and here we come to the issue of, do you want to, in fact, make a living with your art or with your writing? And if you do, then you have to pay some attention to the business side, to the concerns of the market. You need a business model. If it doesn't matter to you, then you don't have to pay any attention to it. But as soon as you want to make a living at it, you do probably have some compromises to make. Although, as I'm trying to point out, I hope throughout this session, it is possible for business and art to meet in a way that doesn't feel like you're selling out or that they're opposed to each other. I think one of the issues in U.S. culture especially 
is that there's a taboo against talking about money and earnings and and business models for artists, uh, especially with accusations of selling out or or doing or or marketing being kind of a dirty practice, uh, and and just generally about no one wants to talk about what money is involved in producing certain types of work. Authors don't want to talk about advances um, or what royalty statements look like because. We, in the U.S., we tend to tie our net worth to our self-worth. I think the more that we can get beyond some of these taboos and restrictions on talking about money, the more, we can ha- the more transparency we have, the more realistic and empowered we can all be. When, some of you know that I started a magazine uh, several years ago called Scratch uh, with a colleague. It's no longer operating, but part of the mission of that publication was to bring greater transparency to the issue of money because not enough people are talking about the realities and and to some extent what works and what doesn't work in transparent ways. Let's go back to this issue of the number of books published annually. So when we saw the rise of literacy, we saw this great increase in, in the number of books published. And we're going through a very similar situation right now. So if you look at the jump from 1825 to 2000, it's the same kind of incredible leap in the amount of material being put onto the market. And if we were to go even further out into the 2010s, you know, it's increased e- even more. So it's, it's really a flood of content that's on the market. And this does change what it's like to have a business model as an artist or a writer. The same things are happening in other communities, particularly in music. It's not just limited to the writing and publishing community. There was a really wonderful article in Seed magazine that discussed the era of universal authorship. You can actually run a Google search on it and read the full article. It should still be available. And they tried to plot the number of people producing content and putting it on the market from the time of Gutenberg to the current day. And if you fold in things like blogging and Facebook and Twitter and other social media where people are actually writing, which I think is fair, you know, you get into a situation where everyone is producing some type of content, even if it's like micro publishing, it's still competing with all of the other stuff that's being put out there by so-called proper authors or publishing companies. Now from Gutenberg until 2000, to publish something was to amplify it. It meant that you could get something known in a fairly reliable way. But given what I just showed you in the era of universal authorship, publishing something does not necessarily amplify it. It's just being added to the content that we're all trying to curate and filter through. We may or may not see it if it's published. It doesn't give it any kind of special status, the fact that it's published. To amplify something has nothing really to do at this point with publishing it. I don't want to simplify what publishing means, but it is kind of like a button, at least for digital content. You publish update or you push the publish button and it immediately goes out to hundreds or millions of people, depending on the size of your audience and your ability to get attention for it. So that's where we come to what it takes to amplify something today. This is why we talk so often about author platform and reader engagement and how to develop your audience. To amplify today is to take advantage of powerful platforms and networks that reach millions of people. And they're some co- sometimes called the Four Horsemen. I think it's an NYU professor who, who dubbed these companies the Four Horsemen, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, because they have the keys to the kingdom when it comes to attention, to delivery, to retail, to knowing what people want and what they're likely to buy. So when authors think about how they're going to reach their readership, it's often through one of these companies, or their publisher is also thinking about it, how it's going to happen through one of these companies, through these discovery channels and distribution channels. So the companies I just mentioned make distribution and publishing of content very straightforward. So that's not the issue any longer. And I'll again add that there's a very similar dynamic happening in in music. You know, distribution isn't necessarily the challenge any longer. It's about getting discovered and building an audience. So this is probably the buzzword in publishing right now. 
and it applies equally to whether you're traditionally published or independently published. Now, when I get to this point in the discussion, talking about the millions of books that are on the market and all of the competition, authors rightly feel a little bit overwhelmed at the task ahead of them. And especially thinking about this issue sometimes goes up against writers' uh, feeling, uh, writers' feelings about who they are, which many writers feel they're introverts, they're not well suited to doing anything but producing the art, they don't feel like they're well suited to engaging an audience, that marketing and promotion stuff is something foreign. But again, I think this is in part trained or learned behavior. It's a message or a myth that you've uh, been hearing again and again from other people in the community. Uh, it's a stereotype and I don't think it should be accepted uh, just because that's how writers or artists are. I don't think they're innately any less well equipped to deal with this than another person. So there's this very romantic ideal of the writer that has developed over the last few hundred years that I think is really holding back writers at this moment in time from addressing the challenges, many of them, the same challenges that they've always had, but just in kind of new clothing. It's, it's not helping writers address them effectively. We're going into it with a negative mindset without even giving it the art and business sides a chance to come together. I love this photo <laughs> of this cat in a, in a carrier. It's not my cat. I found this online. It was someone shared this meme and I'm <clears throat> appropriating it for this presentation to talk about the problem that authors and writers face and how they get so focused on it, they can see nothing else. They don't see the opportunity presented by the ease of distribution. They don't see the opportunities presented by social media. They only see it as something they really dislike uh, without even thinking about the creative or imaginative opportunities that are in the different platforms available. Some of you who may have listened to other talks I've given probably know about what I often counsel, this phrase of thinking beyond the book, going beyond the kind of mythic qualities we've put on, having a particular type of product out there and focusing only on success through that particular type of product. There's a wonderful book called The Curve by Nicholas Lovell. And this is a this was put out by a UK publisher. It's available in the United States, but he's a British author, if I'm I, I believe I'm correct about that. And he presents a really wonderful theory that applies to all types of media, where at one side of the curve, you have the freeloaders and the people who aren't interested, uh, may, might never be interested in paying for what you've got. And then as you move towards uh, the other side of the curve, you've got super fans who are willing to spend any amount. And he took his own medicine here. He didn't just drop this theory in a book and then walk away. He actually implemented a marketing strategy that showed how this works, at least for his type of book and his situation. He had free information and infographics, and then, you, of course, you could purchase the book at a very standard price, and then if you wanted to pay more, you could meet him, have lunch, or do consulting, or take the master class. So authors today need to be thinking through the entire demand curve for their work and not just the single point they've always known, which is the paperback book or the ebook. You want to think through all the different varieties of ways that people may engage with you and interact. Again, think beyond the book. The theory that the curve talks about is, an ex for me, it's an exploration of something that Kevin Kelly put out a number of years ago uh, it was a blog post you can still go read, uh, Eight Things Better Than Free. And he was writing this at a time when there was a lot of controversy around the concept of giving stuff away for free. Of course, there's still a lot of arguments about whether it's effective. But I think as the curve shows, and as Kevin Kelly has shown through many of his writings, you know, just because you give away something for free doesn't mean you aren't going to make money uh, somewhere along the curve or through other types of interaction. And there, there are lots of ways to add value to content or material that go beyond just giving them, say, a, a copy of a book. So they can be the first to receive it or have some sort of exclusive access. 
It can be some sort of a personalized copy, like a signed copy, or even more personalized uh, beyond that. In nonfiction areas, there's often interpretation or analysis or a community that might go along with that. That's a value that would, people would pay for. There's also authenticity um, and patronage, which tie into people's desire to have only the real thing uh, rather than a stolen or pirated copy or to support the people behind uh, the creation of the product, both the author and the publisher or anyone else who contributed to it. There are things better than free that have to do with accessibility, having more types of formats, uh, also embodiment. So this in an author's world, this would be you know the, the book event or the lunch or the dinner or the consulting, the one-on-one. -on -one. And also there are some types of books where uh, findability and discoverability is key to, to what they offer. So if you go and read Kevin Kelly's post, I think if you Google eight things better than free, you'll immediately pull it up. He has a lovely discussion of, of each of these areas. And it helps you stretch beyond the idea that you're giving away the whole, the whole store um, when you make something for free. Now, this isn't an argument for making your book for free. Not everyone should do that, but it is one of the best tools to get started and growing an audience. It's, it's very common to reduce the friction for a new reader to make something for free. And one of the reasons I talk about free a lot is because it gets demonized in the current environment um, as devalu devaluing what authors do, and it's, it's seen as the enemy. But it's a business tool or a business tactic, just like any other business tool or tactic. And it has to be done with a larger strategy in mind, an idea of, of a business model of what will make you money in the long term. One of my favorite authors to talk about in terms of the relationship between business and art is Alan de Botton. He's a UK author who, uh, st I think his first book was a novel, which is how I discovered him. And then he followed, no, actually it was a nonfiction book. I think it was called The Consolations of Philosophy. And then he wrote a novel and then he did a bunch of nonfiction books. And he recently came out with another novel about love. In any event, uh, he is such a fabulous example of someone who has matched his art and his thinking to, to different forms of business. So for instance, he started something called the School of Life in London, which started by offering free Sunday sermons and then grew through paid workshops and classes and merchandise. He started a nonprofit called Living Architecture, which was uh, after his book on architecture came out to help give people an experience of living in a home that's designed to evoke certain moods or discoveries. So, uh, and if you go to um, some of the material for School of Life, like on YouTube or on social media, or if you go to, I think it, he has something called bookoflife.com, which uh, is, a, is basically where you can read all sorts of stuff you would learn if you went to School of Life in London. You'll just see just these fabulous iterations of what he does and his beliefs, some of it free and some of it paid. And I think it's, he's just a classic case study for how business and art come together without compromise, I might add. Uh, this is a, a screen grab or a, a photo of the School of Life in London, which I visited last time I was in the city. It's great. You should visit it if you're, um, if you're ever there. And then I think many of you are probably familiar with Joanna Penn. I'm sure she's also doing a session for The Fringe. And she has been very transparent about where her income comes from. As you can see from one of the most recent charts she released, it's a mix of things. Uh, she's an example of a person who does think beyond the book and has diverse ways of building her career. Chris Guillebeau, unfortunately, whose name I've got a typo in on the slide. Sorry, Chris. Uh, he's another person who I think exemplifies thinking beyond the book and also melding art and business. When I first started following him, he was a blogger <clears throat> uh, at a, it's at his, uh, it's at his author website, chrisguillebeau.com. And as the years progressed, he just built and built and built on top of that until he launched an event called the World Domination Summit, which attracts, uh, I think, it, 
when I went, I have actually attended one of these. I think it had 3,000 attendees. But he's actually trimmed back the attendance to make it more intimate for people. So I think it's been trimmed back to maybe 1,500 people. But in any event, every year uh, in Portland, Oregon, his uh, like-minded community, people who are wanting to bring their idealism to bear on business ideas and nonprofit ideas, they come to learn from each other um, and to get inspired and motivated to act on their ideas and their dreams. And again, it's it's a, a case study in how art and business can dance. So at the very beginning of this talk, I mentioned that there are some competitive creative people who just seem to have all of the success that like just works for them. And even if you followed all the same steps, you just wouldn't see the, the same results. And I know that can be very discouraging when you try the same things and it just doesn't work out. So I'm often asked, well, where did I go wrong or what's the difference? And there are lots of different answers to that question based on the person we're talking about. But sometimes what I see is a lack of self-awareness in the author or the writer who's undertaking a certain strategy. You know, they're trying something because someone else did it. They're not doing it because it necessarily works for them or it appeals to their audience. They're not thinking through what it is that would be most meaningful or what they could sustain or what makes sense given their style and approach and personality. Too often we're led to do things that the community is telling us to do or we're acting based on certain myths in the writing and publishing community such as art and business don't go together. So the more self-awareness you have about what it is you're trying to accomplish in your creative life, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and whose myths you're paying attention to, this, this is like rocket fuel for your career when you start to sort out some of these issues. And this is where we come to one of my key points, which is this game of having a life as a writer, but turning it into a business. It's a very psychological game, and I think in some, sometimes you will hear this from very established writers that the writing life, being a successful writer, um, it, it has a lot to do with the psychological struggle. If you've ever read Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, you know exactly what I mean. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to go take a look. And the ways that it's psychological that, <clears throat> that can sometimes be like a wall standing in your way is when you've got just a lot of baggage that you're carrying about how you think writing and art and business are supposed to go together or not, or certain ideas about what money you're supposed to earn, or you're getting toxic advice from, it could be really anyone, even very well-meaning people give toxic advice. I've been guilty of it in the past. But toxic advice often looks like um, behavioral modification that may not be right for you. For instance, you may see lots of articles out there about how you can get so much more done if you get up at 5 a.m. or you'll be so much more productive or only early morning people are successful or they give that idea that if you're early, if you can force yourself to be an early morning person, you're suddenly um, going to do great. So you'll see all of that type of type of advice floating around out there. And it can just be really confusing. You need to have a pretty strong compass, internal compass, to figure out, is this advice actually going to help me or hurt me? And if we're already kind of wandering and not quite sure what direction to take, we can latch on to this advice and it can do more damage than good. And then finally, and I don't think the industry talks about this nearly enough, there's also a status anxiety that comes into play, our desire for prestige. And this is what leads people to sign deals with traditional publishers that might not actually be that good for them um, because they want the prestige of a traditional publisher. So getting out of these types of shackles is usually not an overnight event because the first step is just recognizing when you're operating or faced with these hurdles. Uh, so you kind of have to start peeling back the layers one by one and also paying attention to your thought patterns when you're having certain thoughts like, oh, I didn't get up early enough today. I'm a terrible writer or um, I can't possibly do this type of work because um, it won't make a good enough impression on so and so. You have to pay more attention to those thoughts so that you can understand when they're actually holding you back from doing the work that you actually really would like to do in the way that you would like to do it. 
there's a really wonderful uh, point in the movie. Oh, I'm I'm now blanking on the on the movie Lost in Translation. <laughs> there's the scene in Lost in Translation uh, with Bill Murray, where he says, uh, "The more you know who you are and what what you want, the less you let things upset you." And I think that's that's part of the guiding truth here. And also the the less you let other people tell you what's appropriate for your business or what your next step is in your business or even how your art and business should come to come together and be expressed. To evoke the imagery of yet another movie, uh, this time Spirited Away, uh, there's a really great scene where our young hero, whose name is Chihiro, <laughs> she has to uh, service a stink spirit that comes in. She's tasked with cleaning him up. And of course, nobody else wants to get near the stink spirit because obviously he stinks and is ugly and gross. But once Chihiro get, does the job of getting rid of all this mud and she like pulls out all of this garbage from inside him, once all of that stuff is shucked off, he is released uh, and flies out of uh, the bathhouse, and it's actually shown that he wasn't a stink spirit after all. He was actually a river spirit. And I often believe that this is a, a very good imagery or metaphor for writers to think about when they're able to get rid of all of the expectation and advice and assumptions about what the writing life is supposed to look like. You too can finally take off in your writing career and kind of fly away from the mess. Um, that you may feel that you're in. This talk was quite a bit more touchy-feely than my usual talks, but I hope you still enjoyed it. I think the key message is that business and art don't have to be antithetical to one another. It may involve some compromises on your part, deciding how they're going to fit together, but I do think everyone ultimately finds a unique business model that works for them, uh, over time. It's certainly an organic process. It, it's one that evolves. And if you can be open to the possibility of business and art connecting uh, in ways that are creative and imaginative, I think you're in a very good place uh, to flourish in your career.